Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted, with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, Seth Morgan. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, Life Unscripted. I'm so grateful to have you here this wonderful Saturday afternoon. Thanks, Christina. It's great to be with you. Yes, yes. And I could tell from their background there, it looks like a beautiful, glorious day wherever you're calling in from. Um, yes. But we're... <laughs> But I'm grateful that you're going to be helping our audience with employee retention strategies post pandemic world. Uh, a lot of my um, companies I've either consulted with, talked to business owners, a lot of them are struggling. Uh, you've heard the the great um, change of hands here. A lot of employees are leaving. Uh, it's hard to keep great talent. And they're like, some companies are getting quite nervous about that. But I know you're going to be able to help them. But before we go to all those juicy details, share a little bit about your backstory. I, I know you're the CEO of MLA. Um, but how did you come to creating your company, getting to where you are today? Yeah, thanks, Christina. Pleasure to be with you. And gotcha. uh, all the best to all the listeners and watchers out there. Uh, so, you know, I joke with people that uh, I got started by being fired, and that's a little bit of a, of a joke. Uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a CPA and uh, started off in my professional world in public accounting, uh, went into what we might consider in the public accounting world industry, meaning I wasn't working for public accounting anymore. It was a turnaround. And uh, over the course of about a three-year period, two-year period, it was clear we weren't going to turn around. And so uh, I exited. I think if I had not chosen to exit, I would have been exited anyway. And that's uh, kind of the joke uh, uh, of why I say I was fired. Mm -hmm. um, the CEO of that company had become a mentor and friend. And uh, I didn't come for much, but he said, write me a business plan and let's do that fractional CFO thing. So awesome. uh, MLA company started very focused on the fractional CFO space. Today, we have got about 35 folks under our umbrella and do everything from uh, the traditional fractional CFO work to M&A to some just pure business consulting process improvement as well as some back office support. So uh, God rest his soul. Uh, my original partner, Harry Loyal, is the L in MLA mm. and uh, passed away last year. So uh, wow. he, was, he was a great mentor. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you are so right. And I, you know, it's how a lot of our um, guests have actually come to starting their businesses is through a, a, a seemingly accident, I got fired, you know, the kids had some whatever, whatever. And, and that's the time where you take either something you need, I find a lot of entrepreneurs will say, Okay, I need this, so I'll create this in your case, you had a talent and you went out there and with your mentor and created this great service. What have you seen through this kind of pivoting time this past year and a half through the pandemic as businesses have had to shift, what has been your biggest takeaway and, and lessons you've learned and your business? Yeah, I, so I think one of the lessons learned is, um, you know, I'm going to say safe for a rainy day, but it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, build up a bunch of cash on your balance sheet. That, that could be part of it. Uh, it's more, you know, that all the hard work we do as business leaders and owners um, tends to be exposed during those periods of time uh, when the stress is the highest. Yeah. Um, I think all of us, I shouldn't speak for the, your audience, but I think the, the world I live in, including MLA, we're a little bit um, uh, pleasantly surprised at how perhaps this did not affect us as we all feared if you rewind the clock to March of 2020 mm -hmm. uh, and the, the rampant amount of fear that was running through all of us um, and wondering if this was kind of the end. But I'll tell you, Christina, coming out the back end, I, I think I've had three referral or four networking referral type meetings with banks, which is yeah. something we regularly do and did pre-pandemic yeah. um, recently, and we're all confused. And so the, the level of uncertainty is still quite high. And I think, yeah. you know, when you think about what a business needs to run, um, it's a fair playground mm -hmm. and, and a level of, of, of uh, an understanding, if you will, of the rules of the game if that makes sense yeah absolutely uh, you what you want to know your competitors aren't getting an unfair advantage over you and you want to know what are the rules of the game and i think uh, the real challenging thing for folks is that uh, some of those rules of the game just seem to be disrupted post pandemic yes. they still seem disrupted and i think what we're really seeing is a combination of a lot of forces that were already in place pre-pandemic that the pandemic is exposed and we're now living with them yeah. Uh, so that's I, I realize that's not much of an answer, but I think it. Yeah. I hope well, it aptly uh, uh, taps into what folks are feeling. It's certainly what we're feeling. 
Yeah, I like that you mentioned that, that that sense of uncertainty. I myself have felt it, so have a lot of the people I've worked with. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. That sense of uncertainty is part of the reason why a lot of companies have told me that they're not signing on maybe as, as quick deal. They've lost some deals too because people are not wanting to stretch their finances out, not knowing what the future holds. And then with recent things, with mandates and such, and, and I think that might have... Um, uh, a play into some of the retention of of employees thinking okay exactly. what's going to happen so no what question. is your take on, on what's going to happen with you know employees and and maybe some people saying hey i'll just wing this myself instead of being an employee how do we hold on to great talent in yeah. these kinds of uncertainty i i think that i think where it starts you might expect a finance person to talk about you know uh compensation packages and i think there's a role for that i absolutely think there's a role for that i think uh, making sure that your employee and and, and uh, hiring processes are down, are down meaning on paper, well defined, yeah. uh, being improved, um, that you've got that down pat. Uh, obviously, there was so much talk of culture, you know, running up to the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. That matters. Uh, yeah. You know, the old joke is everybody has one. Some people just don't <laughs> even recognize what it is. Um, so those kind of classical answers absolutely matter. I think what we saw with our clients, and that doesn't, it's not a perfect science, but is that the employers that really were paying attention to what those employees needed, where they were, uh, and I'm not just talking about kind of the touchy feely collaboration, there's a place for that as well, but yeah. where you're, you're deeping in, you're dipping in deep to what is it that's on their mind. It's often what we find is it's not, it's not money, mm -hmm. uh, it's flexibility, it's family issues at home. Um, this a little bit, again, kind of dealing with what was pre-pandemic and now we're seeing more clearly, I think a little bit of it is the shift in the culture, the shift in the demographics of our employees. So mm -hmm. you're moving from that boomer generation into the X's and the, and the, um, and, and into the, the, the generation, the, you know, the millennials today. And mm -hmm. obviously there's been so much written and talked about that. So I think the pandemic exposed more of those differences and traits. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really, I think it's listening. And I think where that starts, Christina, mm -hmm. again, not knowing exactly the, everybody listening, I, some organizations are probably already doing this. Others, maybe it's going to be a novel idea. I want to encourage you. We're not a large organization, but I want to encourage your audience, start now, do an assessment, do a, do a, hire a firm uh, or, or do your own assessment and, and try to figure out exactly where does, um, where does it fit? Uh, inside of, you know, wh what are your people feeling? What are they, what are they experiencing? And, and start to measure that. And, and uh, that can be a very, very powerful tool uh, uh, as you move forward. Yeah, I love that you say the, the listening part, because one thing I'm getting from some of the people I work with are people are saying, well, you know, my boss just doesn't understand. Schools are not open. Kids are not going back to school. I can't leave my kids alone. So, but you were so spot on about the listening to your employees, wherever they're at, you don't know what their needs are. And it starts with getting a handle on what is your talent need. Now I wanna ask you, what's your take? You said that there's a shift from the boomers to the X and, and to the millennials. I've kind of come to know that millennials care more about, not so much more money, but more like how are you socially um, affecting the world? Like, um, are you making a difference? They want to make a difference in, in their work life. Uh, what have you found working with uh, different generations or different um, people's groups? Uh, I mean, I think that's true, Christina. Mm -hmm. I, but I think sometimes it's a little overstated. So you hear that, you hear that and you start to think to yourself, well, people must, you know, it, it needs to be connected to some incredible social engagement mm -hmm. or, you know, you've got the organizations out there. I, I come from a very evangelical background. There's the business tree idea where churches are actually starting for profits. I mean, those are all cool ideas. Mm -hmm. You run into the organizations like the shoemaker that's sending shoes overseas. I, I think it can be more simple than trying to solve a global problem. Um, yeah. Not to say there's anything wrong with that. And that is really uh, to do the, the, the why analysis. Why does the organization exist? What is the value it's creating for its mm -hmm. customers or its, or its partners and vendors? Mm -hmm. um, what I find is that when we spend the time to focus on that, as MLA has, mm -hmm. um, it really just gives, it gives a purpose to the work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, in some ways, Christina, I think, I think a lot of these things are cyclical, right? Um, we see them come and go. Yeah. Uh, frankly, I'm going to say this, I, again, as business leaders listening to this, this is going to sound a little countercultural. You know, some people do need to move on, right? Uh, some of the folks, you know, Turnover is not always a bad thing when yeah. you're following the, the Jack Welch model and saying, I want to improve the type of people yeah. I have. But 
obviously the reason this is such a hot topic is the labor shortage is affecting every organization we're aware of. Yeah. And uh, so people are looking to retain as much as they can. And, and, and so I think just connecting in with the why of why you exist is maybe the most important thing you can do in that creating that social infrastructure for those, those, those employees. Yeah, I, lo- I love that you say that because I started a company many years ago, it was a tech company, and it was very new starty and, and everyone can get their hands dirty doing a million different things. They grew so fast. Within five years, they were a multi, I think 400 million, it was crazy. They grew wow. so much. But some of the people who had been there in the beginning where there wasn't much structure and they can get their hands dirty in a million different things, you had to add more structure in order to keep growing. And some of the older folks who had started day one were not happy that they had to stay inside of more of a box. So for them, we, we offered them a severance package because really they weren't happy anymore because they were not able to get their hands dirty in a whole bunch of millions of things. So you make a good point there. Sometimes as the business grows, it doesn't always fit all employees. Right. That's right. And I, again, that's not me suggesting you start killing <laughs> folks off. But once you've done those basic steps and you know what your why is, you're, you're, you're connecting that with the fabric of the employee group. And, and again, that, that depends on the type of employee, the type of organization you're running. Um, but I think people need that buy-in. They need that touch point, especially this millennial generation. They need, they need to understand why, why is it I do what I'm doing, what I'm doing. I, people are looking for meaning. Yeah. Uh, and especially after being locked up for a year and a half, people are really looking for meaning, right? And, and they want that connection. Uh, they want to know something. how everything fits together. Am I just coming That's here right. and plugging numbers all day long? Or does this yeah. really mean something? And That's no, right. I, I get that. You want to feel, I, I like feeling at the end of the day that I did my absolute best and I made a difference for the company I'm working with. And I'm sure every employee feels the same way. It's not just the paycheck. You know, right. and I think it was Dan Pink. He wrote a book. I don't remember what book it was, but it was talking about motivation. It was the fact that money is not the best motivator. It works a little bit when you first give an increase, but then they slide right back down. You need to add more than that. And the vision makes total sense. Right. That's correct. Yeah, totally yeah. agree with you, Christina. And I think it's an important part. And, and I, the, the assessment that we suggested, mm-hmm. that should be part of that testing, right? Mm-hmm. Why, why, or why are you here? How do you see that connected to your day-to-day life, et cetera? So go exactly. ahead, sorry. No, no, no worries. So now that people are starting to bring their companies back into the mainstream, we're getting back into offices. Have you seen anything that works for getting people on a kind of complete basis in the office or a mix? What works best for the transition? What have you found? Uh, so that's really, I think, an open question. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you and say we've got it nailed. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking about MLA. MLA is still. I mean, we've been affected by the shutdown. Uh, we were affected by the fact that most people went home. We never formally shut down. We were considered an essential business because of the services we offer. But obviously, we cared deeply about our team, and we wanted to make sure they were safe and comfortable. And so our office never completely shut. And, and so as I like to say, we never hard closed, but we also never hard opened. Mm. And so the behaviors of the team has certainly shifted. Um, and frankly, as the CEO, I'm trying to figure out, do I start to lock down on that again? Because I, I'm one that believes uh, being together does produce a different type and maybe better type of result uh, hmm. than simply letting everyone work virtually. And I think this is also cyclical. Uh, Christina, you, you know, you and I will probably be retired by the time somebody, somebody says, bring that guy back on because he, he was proven right. I mean, these cycles can run in a long, long periods of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think within our client set, thinking about the businesses that we serve, you know, it's, I think it's largely run along need. Mm-hmm. There's just some client, you know, that they, they have to have people in, in locale. And so I think most, most of our clients have taken kind of the approach we have, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't know that we have a perfect answer. Mm-hmm. You know, the easy answer is set a policy and make folks stick with it. But I think yeah. that flies directly in the face of everything we just talked about, which is exactly. hearing and caring deeply about what our, our team members care about. So. Um, I will observe that I do not think doing what we're doing right now, uh, you know, connecting virtually is, is near a good medium uh, for communication. And I think we're going to learn that over the long haul. And so yeah. I would encourage folks to be sensitive to that yeah. uh, while they recognize that, you know, behaviors change, cycles change, trends change. Uh, this is certainly very convenient. We can get a lot done this way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think you can replace uh, sitting with or across from someone. Yeah. And um, examining body language, uh, you know, yeah. what do they say? 90% of communication is nonverbal. Yeah. Uh, and I think we missed a lot of that. And yeah. uh, frankly, can... I, I think we miss a lot of, of the soul's need for community too, just to be very blunt with you. We, we're, we're, we're communal people. That's how we're, that's, that's how we're made. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think we get some of the visual content from like Zoom, but I love to reach out and touch someone. I'm I'm a very what? tactile person. I'm not that I go hugging all my um my you know my uh, the people I work with, but you know I like to be able to be around them physically. And there is a different element to that 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 you know when you can communicate be together as a community than based in this virtual world. And I found for some of the people I worked with who were alone, maybe during shutdown and had no one with them, no family no kids they suffered the most mentally because to not have that connection with other humans it is so important so i think you're right especially for kids um we're gonna see that this has not been the best method to like forever let's just go virtually forever because we are a uh, humans uh, very a community-based type people but so now anyone listening in what would be your top advice for um you know, in this post pandemic world, getting, you know, the culture set and, and retaining their, their um, best talent. What are some of your, like, if you had to give one top tip? Yeah, I think, um, I think the top tip that, that I have found most useful in my experience is the, is the assessment. And I realize there's a lot of, you know, what, what could we do? Yeah, there, there's a lot of ways to do an assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage you to work with the person if, you know, if you've got an HR professional or, even better yet, someone who is culturally or organizationally oriented, not necessarily HR specific, mm -hmm. uh, tap them, start, start to have that conversation. But um, the top tip would be to get moving on that. What I have found, Christina, is that um, I was been amazed and surprised positively at the results. Now that may not be true in, in your audience's experience, but, and it gives, you know, maybe it's because I'm a, again, training by training and finance person, it gives a baseline for me to start to work from, to try to monitor the health it would be like, um, it's almost like, you know, if you went to the doctor, you'd never been to the doctor before, you don't want, you don't know what normal is or good is. And then you get a bunch of results. What do you do with that? Well, I want to now know, I mean, it's part of my regular ask, like, where is the team and the process of understanding again, how they fit? Um, how do they view compensation? For instance, in our organization, they view compensation is more fair than I thought they were. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, a, that was a major revelation to me. So here I was living as the leader under this this idea that there was probably a level of dissatisfaction in the team that really didn't even exist. Hmm. Um, I think your listeners probably are going to experience something similar. So the top tip would be to get started on that yesterday. And we can't do that yesterday. So the next best is today. Yeah. Uh, and to not be so afraid to, to, to tap into that resource. Those are your people. Yeah. And I think that not only gives um, you great data as the leader, but it also helps your people to a start if they haven't to feel yeah. like a part of something, right? Because now they're feeding into that. So yeah. I, that would be my top tip. Um, I love that. We could do all kinds of other things, right? We could do, you know, the, the review process and make sure that's mm -hmm. right. Look at compensation, look at incentives. We've got mm -hmm. clients doing that. We believe in all of that. That's great stuff. But if, but if it's out of context to how are the people actually feeling and can I measure that and track mm -hmm. that and watch that as, as a key metric for me, then you're probably missing value and all the other steps. Yeah, I, I totally get you. And one of the top things I'm getting from you is really just start with listening to your crew. What are their needs and how do we go forward um, at the company uh, based on your full vision that you're able to get forth to them? Uh, it's been a fabulous chat with you, Seth. I don't want us to leave without everyone finding out how they can find out more about you, work with you. How can they do that? Thank you, Christine. It's been great to be with you. The easiest way is just to use uh, the web. So MLA companies, and it's just like it sounds, M like Mary, L like Larry, A like Adam, but it stands for Morgan Loyal and Associates. MLA companies, companies is plural.com, and you can find my bio and some of our services, et cetera. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Seth Morgan, for coming to share your great brilliance today on Savvy Broadcasting. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Christine. All the best to all of you. You betcha. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more savvy episodes and savvy biz tips, go to www.lifeunscriptedradio.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at lifeunscriptedradio.com.